Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this uh, session again. Um, so looking at early colonizing bacteria is something we've been doing for the last five years or so. And when we started looking at it, I was actually amazed how little there was known about how bacteria colonize the gastrointestinal tract of chicks and then how this microbial succession occurs in the broilers because we know that the microbiome is essential for health and production efficiency. Um, and the other thing is in normal, well, in other livestock species, you have maternal transmission, you have vertical transmission from the mother to, to the babies. Here though, the chicks are removed from the hen and then they hatched in an incubator. Let me just put my laser point on. So there's, we weren't sure how much vertical transmission there really could be under, in this sort of situation. I mean, the eggs too are cleaned, fumigated, and a lot of this was done to remove pathogens, and that was very successful in, you know, in the case of certain salmonella pathogens that actually affect the birds, like uh, Gallinarum. But we, you know, as I said, we need to know what colonizes this, these these birds. Is it coming from the maternal? Is there some transfer from the from the maternal line? Is stuff coming from the hatchery? I mean, we also know that um, pests and stuff within both the houses and the hatchery, are the bacteria coming from there? The first time these chicks are actually exposed to sort of an adult microbiota is when they're put on the farm. And especially if there's used litter on the farm, then they get exposed to adult microbiota. And then bacteria will also be coming in from the feed. So I show this hand holding these eggs here. And in the lab, we always joke that the microbiota of these chicks is whoever touched those eggs last. Well, that was why when I saw this paper that recently came out, I just had to laugh, but it's a paper on the early life assembly of gut microbiota in passerine chicks. And they actually had hand a hand reared group. So what um, these authors did was they had separate finches, lay the eggs, and then they removed some of the eggs and had them reared by another finch group, so foster parents. And then they took another set of eggs, which they, it hatched in an incubator and then hand reared. And so they were trying to figure out where the early life bacteria are coming from that colonize these chicks. So they looked within the adults, they looked at the gut, oral and crop microbiome. And within the chicks, they followed the gut microbiome up to 10 days. And then for the environmental microbiota, they looked within the nest and the feed. And what I think they missed here is what was in the incubator. So when they looked at the microbial community structures across these finch environmental samples, this is multidimensional scaling, and we're seeing this in two dimensions, but each of these um, dots represents a sample and represents the microbiota of that sample. And so we have the feed here in, in red, and then we have the chicks that are both fostered in yellow and the ones from the actual zebra finch parents across on the right-hand side of, of the of the plot, but the ones that have been hatched in the incubator and hand reared, we have, and I can't remember which day is which, but we have the day three and the day seven birds, and they on the opposite side of this plot. And if you, it's not overlaid, but if you look at the adults, the nest and the feed, so here's the feed that's in the same split places where the chicks are in, in the same plot. And you'll see that the chicks that are both fostered and reared by their parents, are on the same side of the plot as the adults, both the, um, actually it's closer to the nest microbiota here shown in, in these yellow dots, and here the adult guts, and then the adult oral microbiota. So when they looked at that in, in a little bit more detail, when they were actually looking at the source tracking, what they found is that the incubator hatched hand reared chicks all they could determine was that 2% of the microbiota came from the feed and the other 98% was from unknown sources. As I said, they didn't actually swab the incubators or possibly the hands of the people who were rearing them. Um, the society finch fosters, when they followed those out over 10 days, they found that eventually the most microbiota ca actually came from the gastrointestinal tract of their foster parents, whereas the actual zebra finch, it started off with the oral microbiome and then eventually there were more, um, but day 10, a, a, large, a larger proportion of the gastrointestinal, of the microbiota was from the gastrointestinal tract of the parents. 
What I'd like to show you here, though, is sort of the diversity of different types of bacteria that you're finding. So if you look across the feed shown in red, there's a certain diversity of, of bacteria, but mainly Enterobacteriaceae and Bacillaceae. Whereas if you look within the hand, the hand-reared birds, you're seeing Enterobacteriaceae by day three and uh, by day seven, Enterococcaceae. And I want you to remember what this looks like because um, when you look at the day of hatch chicks, it's very, very similar to this. Whereas if you look at the fostered birds and you look at the zebra finch raised birds, there's a lot more diversity in the microbiota. And we've had a number of people speaking today about how important it is to have a diverse microbiota. So why do I think it's important to really determine what the early colonizing bacteria are? Well, I really believe that whoever comes there first is going to set up the entire succession for that bird, and that's going to affect the health and productivity of these, these birds. So if you look at the, um, if the host selects who gets there, it doesn't matter which species get there first, eventually you're going to end up with, in this case, a blue microbiota. I believe that it's more whoever gets there first is going to set up the succession differently, and you might end up with a yellow and a blue microbiota instead. Now, I'm not saying that if you start with a soil micro microbiome in these chicks that they're going to end up staying with the soil microbiome, there is going to be some host selection. It is going to be gastrointestinal microbiota that are eventually present there. But I do believe that whether you have what's shown here as a yellow microbiota or a blue microbiota has an effect on the function as well. And now, in some cases, it may not. Functionally, they may be the same. But from the studies that I've seen so far on birds, that is not the case. So I'll show you some of those studies. So this was a study that was done in 2013. And there were three replica trials in male cob broiler chickens. And so these um, birds came from the same hatchery, same genetics, just over three different time points. The feed was exactly the same. They'd made the feed in, at one time point and kept it under um, cool, dry conditions. But you can see just by eye, if you each, each one of these um, columns or bars is a specific bird, and then these colors represent different types of bacteria. And just by eye, you can see that time one has a different type of microbiota than time two and time three. The other thing I want to point out, and this is also something that has been mentioned a couple of times at this conference, is that there's a lot of bird-to-bird -bird variability as well. So even though these all came from the same hatchery, were fed the same diet, were under a more controlled condition than you'd find on a, in a, an actual production facility, there was still a lot of bird-to-bird -bird variability and time differences. And this did have an effect on feed conversion. So... These are the, the feed conversion means for trial one, trial two, and trial three. And even though, you know, you can see in trial three that there's a lot more variability in the feed conversion for these birds. So there was an effect in performance on these birds. A more recent study, and I think Tim Johnson actually presented this at the conference last, last year, where he was looking at um, antibiotic free production and he de determined that there was the commercial broiler chicken bacterial microbiota correlated strongly with performance. And the way he did this was he followed different flock cycles from four different farms over time. So flock cycle one, flock cycle two, and then jumped to flock cycle five and looked at the microbiota. And if we just look at the data here, I'm concentrating on the ileum. In the study, they looked at Sika and trachea as well, and then they also looked at litter samples from these farms. I believe, and we, we tend to work within the small intestine because we believe that if we see differences in the small intestine, it's going to have a bigger effect on the bird. And so um, cycle one is shown here in the red dots. Cycle two is shown in the green dots, and that is kind of more spread across the whole PCAO plot. And then by cycle five, there's actually a, a total shift in microbiota and doesn't even really overlap with what was present at cycle one. So these are birds coming from the same, same barns, I mean, different flocks, but it's from the same barns, and there's been a total shift in microbiota in the ileum. And then um, what, they, what Tim Johnson also determined was that there was an effect they could correlate it with growth rate because specifically cycle one and cycle two, there was 
um, much higher body weights in the cycle one than there was in cycle two. So then he does have some um, charts in, in his paper where he shows specific microbiota associated with growth or with negatively correlated with growth as well. So when we've been looking at this, so some of our earlier studies that we've done, and this is what I just uh, showed last year, was that there is some effect of the maternal flock, but we find that most of the effect is coming from the hatchery. And so if we look at just one, one chart of what I showed last year, so this is the small intestinal microbiota in day old chicks and poults. We've got the chicks here, we've got three different hatcheries and three different poult hatcheries. And just by eye, you can see that there are differences in each group of birds. So um, in group C here in chicks, most of the bacteria that are, or most of the birds have predominantly E. coli at day of hatch. Whereas if you look at um, E and F, we're actually seeing, we are seeing some Clostridia and E. coli, but we're actually seeing some environmental organisms at day of hatch. Whereas if you look at the poults here, we're finding a lot of Clostridium salatum present. Um, some of the birds have higher levels of Entrococcus faecalis, but statistically each one of these came out as, you know, being a distinct, unique group. But again, bird to bird variability, I'd like to point out again. I mean, here we have birds that are mainly E. coli. Um, this yellow is mainly Entrobacter, where some birds are mainly Clostridium salatum at day of hatch. So as I've already mentioned, we know microbiota influences health and production efficiency of poultry, but we found it to be highly variable within and between broiler and turkey flocks. And that's not just our data, that's also in the literature. Um, what we have shown and what we showed last year is that the microbiota acquired by Dale chicks and poults is mainly influenced by environmental factors of the hatchery. So what we decided to do now for our new study is survey the microbiota of integrated broiler complexes across all production stages. Previously, we'd only focused on the breeders and the, the day of hatch, the birds at the day of hatch and a little bit on the broilers. And our ultimate aim is to correlate the microbiota from the different hatcheries with performance parameters of the broiler flocks. So if you look at an integrated broiler production system, you, you generally have one feed mill, a number of pullet farms, which then feed through to the breeder farms, and then those eggs go through to the hatchery. So I've highlighted this in red, there's one hatchery. I think it is very, very important what's happening here as to how the rest of these broiler production farms, which could be up to 200, would be uh, the performance of these farms. And then eventually they go through to the processing plant. So you go from 1.4 million chicks per week and with some, you know, morbidity, mortality, you end up with 1.3 million birds per week. And this is just, you know, an average um, integrator. So I'm gonna show you some, this is, this is very preliminary data. We probably have a couple of dozen, two or three dozen um, broiler complexes that we have um, sampled so far. I've only got data right now for four of those. And so I'm just gonna show you some of the highlights that we've seen so far. So these were um, collected in October and November and December of last year. Complex one was no antibiotics ever. The other three complexes were actually still conventional. They were still on antibiotics as, as feed growth promoters, which isn't very common anymore in, in the industry in the United States. And if I remember correctly, each of these were actually on a different antibiotic as well. Market age for two of these complexes were six weeks, nine weeks for another two. And we tried to get sort of the same amount of pullets, breeders, day of hatch and broilers across the systems. We didn't always, like complex two, we weren't able to get pullets. Um, and if, is the, if, if the birds went out to nine weeks, we actually got more broilers to, con to follow out over the weeks. So the first thing we always do is look at the levels of pathogens within um, the birds. And so we have here complex one, two, three, and four. We have the data for the pullets, for the hens, for the day of hatch, and for the broilers. And so, we didn't see a significant difference within um, the pullets. We didn't have a lot of numbers, but you can see even then some of these birds have really, really high levels of avian pathogenic E. coli and others were below our detection limit. Um, again, no significant difference in the breeders 
Although again, sometimes we had, like here, we had levels that were above 10 to the 7, so really, really high levels of avian pathogenic E. coli. And this is in the small intestine, right? So we're looking at the small intestine. You'd kind of expect to have levels of certain, like Clostridia and, and E. coli to be higher in the cecum. But when we see these levels, these high levels within the small intestine, it sort of indicates to us that there may, may be some issues with some of these birds. But we're focusing on the hatchery, and here we saw the biggest differences. So hatchery one, we not one of these birds had levels of E. coli or avian pathogenic E. coli that were above our detection limit. Now, I'm not saying there weren't E. coli. It's just the detection limit for our plate counts. It was below that. Um, and then complex three, every single, almost every single bird had avian pathogenic E. coli at really, really high levels. So this, there were definitely significant differences within um, the hatcheries with the avian pathogenic E. coli that were present at of Hatch. And this we had seen before, and I shared something similar with you last year with different complexes. And then we did have an effect too along the broilers, and it seemed as though the ones that were on, on some sort of antibiotic tended to have lower levels of avian pathogenic E. coli. But again, it varied from bird to bird with a number of birds below the limit of detection and other birds above a million CFU per gram. The other pathogen that we always look at is Clostridium perfringens. So here in the pullets and the breeders, we are finding significant differences within the, the complexes. Again, one or two of the hens in complex one had really, really high levels of pathogens. Um, but in general, complex three tended to have higher levels of Clostridium perfringens in both the pullets and the breeders. We didn't detect any Clostridia or Clostridium perfringens in the birds at day of hatch. And that is something that in, in turkeys and uh, poults, we do actually often find Clostridia, not necessarily Clostridium perfringens, but Clostridia. And then within the, um, the broilers, there was a slight difference as well. And again, the birds that were on the no antibiotic program seem to tend to maybe have higher levels of costume perfringens. So if we look at the small intestinal microbiota across all production stages of the four complexes, we have the pullets, we have the breeders, the day of hatch and the broilers. Um, I've labeled some of the, the important bacteria. So at day of hatch, we're mainly seeing Enterobacteriaceae or Enterococcaceae shown here in, in the um, gray. This is kind of a, a false way to look at it, because if you look at it this way, if you average it, it looks like the birds in complex one had some Enterobacteriaceae and some Enterococcus, but really bird by bird, some birds had only Enterobacteriaceae or mainly Enterobacteriaceae and other birds mainly Enterococcus. Now, pullets we've never really looked at before, so I thought this was interesting. We had a couple of birds that had mainly Helicobacteriaceae and then we're also seeing higher levels of Rumnococcaceae within the pullets. Um, so yesterday at one of the workshops, um, Christian gave a really good explanation of constrained ordination, but this is what we use to, do, to relate multiple variable, variables, in this case, that's the bacterial families, to explanatory variables, which is life stage. And so then we look at the explained variation. So day of hatch here, this is, the, the average of all the day of hatches. If you look, think of it as a PCOA plot, you'd have all the um, day of hatches in a cloud around it. But this is the central point for the day of hatches. And those are significantly different with a pseudo F of 19.3, which is really high. The pseudo F of one means that there's no difference between, um, but between the groups. So really what we're seeing here is a succession effect. We've got the day of hatch, then the broilers, the pullets, which go up to um, 20 weeks, and then the breeders, and you're seeing a lot more diversity and a lot more um, different groups of bacteria associated with the breeders. If we look at the day of hatch, now remember this is just four different um, complexes. Eventually we hope to have, you know, about 30 complexes included in here, and we're also going to look at complexes over time. But what I want to show you here is that we have certain birds that have mainly um, Enterobacteriaceae and other birds that have mainly Enterococcaceae. And what I show in complex one, where we weren't able to detect any other E. coli or Clostridia, I show some of these here that we weren't able to actually get any sequences out of it. So it, it almost looks like these birds are, are sterile birth, which I know they, they really aren't, but 
even for sequencing, the levels of bacteria that were present in the gut were below the level of detection. And we are seeing some significant differences between them, very low pseudo Fs, but that's because there's a lot of, again, bird to bird variation and there's only, you know, a couple of families um, present in these birds. The, the pullets, and this is what I said, we'd never looked at pullets before. And this is where we had some birds that had Helicobacteriaceae as the predominant bacteria, but also we're seeing higher levels of Rumnococcaceae than we normally see within the gastrointestinal tract. And, you know, pullets are, are fed differently than both the broilers and the breeders. They um, often have skip a day feeding, they're only fed once a day. And I mean, they these pullets have to get to sort of adult size, you know, four to five pounds over a 20 week period, whereas the broilers within six weeks, they're, they're ready for harvest. So there's, they are, you know, considerable difference in how they are raised. And so we should expect to see a difference within the um, bacteria as well. And I just want to point out, this is just all the broilers together. We're seeing a big difference by um, week of age. So again, week zero, which is mainly the day of hatch birds, um, to week one, week two, week three. And generally we consider birds to be, have a sort of mature microbiota by week three. So we'll see that here, that there's no real difference between week four, week five, week six. We are seeing a difference by week nine, but again, that's a, a small group of birds and they are the most mature birds, obviously. So last year I showed uh, we've got a multi-strain hatchery probiotic and I showed some of the results. So I'm um, just highlighting that again, I don't have any new results or new studies on this multi on this hatchery probiotic. But at seven days, we'd reduced avian pathogenic E. coli in the treated birds. And the main effect that we saw was that even though the, the body weight of these birds was about the same, there was increased uniformity in the birds that had been um, fed this hatchery probiotic. So to summarize, early colonizing bacteria and avian species, um, the avian pathogenic E. coli in the small intestine vary by bird and complex at day of hatch. The predominant bacteria in the small intestine are Enterobacteriaceae, but other bacteria that are common are Enterococcaceae, uh, which we know is Enterococcus faecalis because we also um, isolate in, in um, some of these strains. And then specifically in, in um, turkeys, we've also seen Clostridium salatum. And then as you know, a number of people have mentioned, bird-to-bird -bird variation is very high in pulse breeders and broilers. And before I, before I leave, I know uh, Tom might want, want to ask me some questions, but I want to give a quick shout out to Wen Lillehoy's talk for tomorrow. So we did a study with her where um, we had birds on normal feed, and then we fed them our Bacillus subtilis 1781, 747 individually. Now, we don't normally do that. We normally have our bacillus in combination, but we wanted to have an idea of what was happening within, with the metabolites. So I'm just quickly skip that. Um, so even though it was a single strain of, of bacillus that was fed and was only fed from day 14 to day 21, normally we'd feed um, from day one when they arrive on the farm. And we still saw a significant effect on body weight gain with these two, two bacilli. And hopefully, when when's when speaking tomorrow about the effect of metabolites and she's done a whole lot of other studies as well other than this one with us but i'm hoping she's going to share some of the metabolite data but what i wanted to show is that um if you look at the microbiota so again this was just fed for a week bacillus 747 and 1781 had a, a, a different effect on the microbiota than the birds in the control group and one of the predominant bacteria that we're seeing is Arthromatus, in specifically in the Bacillus 747 group. And again, studies by um, Tim Johnson, both in broilers and in turkeys, have shown that um, performance and body weight gain within broilers and turkeys are positively associated with Arthromatus early on um, in, in the bird's life. So here's a very recent picture of our poultry team. As you can see, they're not social distancing, but they're all wearing their masks. Um, Jody leads the team and Josh Rayberger is the one who actually does all the, the Illumina data and the analysis for us. And um, Tamia here has only joined us in, I think, April. So she's never actually seen us without masks. 
Okay, Tom. Excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation there, Zandra. Uh, some, some great insights, I'm sure, for, for everyone there. Um, so we have had a question come in. Um, so they've asked any any ideas on, on how we can account for the variability in poultry between in, individuals and are there any thoughts as to what is responsible for this variability? So what I, what I, I think it's really got to do with who colonizes those bacteria, those those birds first. So that's why I think it's really important that we get the right bacteria in there really early on. I mean, even, even if you look at mice within, um, you know, university type settings and stuff, we're seeing, um, you know, variation between, between animals and stuff. But I think in birds, because you don't have that maternal transmission and the, and the chicks are hatched in, in an incubator, that you have more chance to get this, um, you know, bird to bird variation. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and another question for you here is, uh, what performance parameter would determine the effect of optimizing the early colonizing bacteria in, bro in broilers? So I think if, you, if you're looking at the hatchery, one of the things that they look at is hatchability. And one, one of our speakers this, today actually spoke about hatchability. Um, in our case, though, we're not, think, we're not necessarily giving a probiotic or a, some sort of product in ovo like, like that. Um, like that study that was presented earlier. So I think what we need to look at specifically for the hatchery is day seven mortality, that that is a, a good indicator of, you know, how healthy the birds are when they get to the farm. Okay, perfect. Excellent, Zandra. Um, so I don't think we have, have had any more questions come in, um, but I was wondering um, if you could summarize your, your oh, actually we had, had one just come in just in the right time. Okay. Um, so <laughs> is that variability only at the taxa level? Um, if you analyze based on uh, pie crust, I believe it is, does some of that go down? Um, I haven't actually tested these on pie crust and I'm sure it does. And but we have looked at the metabolites, and what we do see is that e even though there is differences in the microbiota, we're seeing some similar effects within the the metabolites or similar changes in the metabolites. So it could, and no, sorry, that study was done between different groups. I'd I'd have to really look at it again within a specific group and see how much variability there was by group. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, just the last question. Um, so if you were to summarize your, your, your presentation today and kind of three, three main takeaways, what, what would they be? Um, I really think it's important to look at the early life colonizers, especially in birds. I mean, I think it's important too for, for swine and, and ruminants as well, but especially in birds because we don't have that maternal transmission. Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm actually surprised how little we do know about early colonizing bacteria within a bird system. So there's a lot of research, I think, that can still be done on that. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very, very much, Jandra, for your presentation and for your help across the day. Um, it, it's been, been, been very appreciated.